morning, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to this uh, uh, webinar. I'm Sergio Guillén, um, the Deputy Coordinator of ODIN. I, I, I give you a welcome to this uh, webinar, uh, ODIN webinar series. ODIN is the Smart Hospital of the Future, uh, a, a flagship project of the uh, Horizon 2020. Um, I'm very pleased uh, today to present the first webinar of the of the series. Uh, this is a long series that will uh, take place this year and the and the next one. And you will be uh, kindly invited to participate in all of, in in all of them. Um, but uh, today we are focusing on the integrate robotics uh, uh, matters uh, in the for the hospital of the of the future. And we without uh, any more. Uh, um, delays. I would like to invite uh, the, uh, Professor Paolo Dario to take the floor. He's the chairman of the webinar. So I can give you the floor, uh, Paolo, to start uh, the meeting of, of today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paolo. Uh, I, I'm very glad, honored to have the uh, responsibility to chair this uh, webinar uh, of the Odin uh, project. You know, the Odin project is uh, a, a Horizon 2020 uh, European project in the area of innovation action. And the topic is, uh, of course, uh, very, very important. It's about uh, robotic logistics and more in the hospital of the future. We all know how important it is. This has been also uh, pointed out uh, during the COVID-19 emergency. But more in general, it is uh, uh, prominent important to design and test uh, different solutions for the hospital of the future using artificial intelligence and, uh, and uh, robotics. Um, <clears throat> I'm a professor of biorobotics at the Scuola Superi Sant'Anna in Pisa, uh, Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to start by showing uh, the agenda of uh, the webinar. So after this very short introduction, uh, four uh, three speakers uh, will uh, present a different aspects of uh, uh, the, the, the new technologies and emergent solutions for uh, uh, the hospital of the future. I would like just to remind the rules of this webinar. So the session will be recorded and it will be then uploaded in the public, public site. Uh, I would like to ask all of us and you to remain muted during the session and uh, uh, you can send uh, uh, messages, but also questions uh, to the panelists uh, for the round table uh, session. Um, so the first speaker of uh, the series is uh, uh, Professor Gastone Ciuti. Uh, Professor Gastone Ciuti will talk about uh, uh, integrated robotics in healthcare. Uh, so, how uh, the ODIN project will contribute in this respect to create the hospital of the future. Uh, Professor Gastone Ciuti uh, is, a, is a recognized uh, expert uh, in uh, uh, medical robotics, uh, surgical robotics in particular, but also in uh, uh, different solutions uh, using artificial intelligence and robotics, in fact, to uh, improve services and to improve uh, the safety and efficiency, efficiency of processes in the clinical set, uh, setting. Um, the, the next speaker will be uh, Marta Miller. Uh, she will talk about robot logistics and automation technology in healthcare scenarios. Uh, Marta has received uh, a Bachelor and Master of Science in Industrial uh, Robotics. Uh, so she's an expert in automation and robotics. And uh, uh, she works uh, with Robotnik. So she participates uh, as uh, an actor in the development of robotic solutions for logistics. And she will talk uh, uh, about that. 
Um, the the uh, third speaker will be Francesco Ferro. Uh, Francesco Ferro uh, has a, a background in, uh, in robotics and uh, is a, a CEO and founder of PAL Robotics, that is one of the leading service robotic companies worldwide uh, located in, uh, in Spain. And uh, so he will talk about humanoids, uh, which are his uh, real passion, and more, of course, in the healthcare uh, scenario. Um, I think that the speakers uh, will provide a very nice uh, set of uh, information on, uh, on, on the different aspects of uh, uh, the hospital in the future. So with that, I would like to give the floor to Professor Gaston Kitty talk about integrated AI-based robotics. Thank you very much, Professor Dario. I, I really appreciate being here with you for, uh, you know, starting this, uh, this webinar. Let me just be sure that you hear me well. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so we can start. You, uh, you already introduced me uh, really briefly. I'm a biomedical engineer. I got my PhD in biorobotics at Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. Today, I'm an associate professor of bioengineering and the chief executive officer of a spin-off company of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna working on collaborative and medical robotics. Uh, I work at Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. This is the headquarter located in Pisa. And in particular, I'm active at one of the seven institutes of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pontedera, very close to Pisa, that is the Biorobotic Institute. Let me give you a very brief overview of what I will touch during this uh, uh, presentation. First of all, a general overview on integrated robotics in healthcare. And then I would like to discuss about the key robotic technologies that are necessary to build a knee health robot, then trends and open issues to conclude briefly about how the European Odding project is going to integrate that technologies to make the step ahead. So let's start by a general overview on integrated robotics in healthcare. The global healthcare robotic market is great. Is, is is registering a combo annual growth rate that is very high. It's, it's over 20%. And so we have to expect uh, in the next year, a uh, more and more introduction and consolidation of robotic technologies into the healthcare sector. But uh, who knows me knows that I like to start from the beginning because in order to know how the healthcare robotics is today, we have to know about how robotic was at the beginning. So here you see the screenshot of, uh, of the first patent about uh, robots. It's a programmed article transfer and this patent has been filled in 1954 by a very important person that is George Devil Jr. George Devil Jr., together with uh, the father of robotics, Joseph Engelberger, let's say, just created the first companies about robotics, Unimation Inc., in 1962. And uh, that's a very important picture about people that establish which kind of robot? This kind of robot. So robots for automation, robot that works uh, and work it and works today in a very complex scenario, industrial scenario, where actually I would say that people should not stay there. Okay. This is uh, a first example of robot. And uh, today, now it looks uh, so far from uh, what is robotics now. But again, it's important to know you know, the principle under the evolution of robotics. Evolution that uh, going closer and closer to healthcare, uh, yeah, we have to touch a few milestones more. An important milestone is this one, 1950, Harold Hopkins, a person that allowed the uh, transition from open surgery to minimal invasive surgery, thanks to the use of what? Of what invented? So the optical fibers and cylindrical lenses, a system called endoscope that was able to completely change the paradigm of doing, uh, let's say, medicine. 
because instead of opening the patient, if we talk about abdominal surgery, thanks to this small high, this small rod that uh, it's introduced through a trocker into the cavity, the human cavity, it can allow to see inside, to scope, to see inside the human patient and then use other small tools, uh, uh, laparoscopic instruments, arthroscopic instruments. So very small and thin uh, devices to reduce the invasiveness of surgery. Another important milestone that uh, gives, let's say, uh, a step ahead in the evolution of uh, medicine closer and closer to medical robotics is uh, Dr. Robert Ladley that introduced the most powerful diagnostic case since the discovery of the X-ray invented uh, what he called Automatic Computerized Transverse Axial Scanner, ACTA, what today is called computer tomography. And in that case, uh, the minimal invasive surgery got the information, the integration of the information by images. And so in that case, we move from a simple minimal invasive surgery to a computer assisted surgery, to a computer integrated surgery, where the computer and the integrated information and data through different sensors around a complex surgical scenario are important are in progress. for preoperative and intraoperative, let's say, operations. Let me go back to a little bit more older George Devil with uh, one of the most important robots, the Puma robots. Uh, why I'm showing you that? Because industrial robot is the one you will find in this uh, very important paper, 1988, the Transaction of Biomedical Engineering, where an industrial robot, the Unimate Puma 200, was used for the first robotic uh, surgical procedure in the brain with a CT guided stereotactic frame. And they demonstrated more accuracy than using a manually adjustable frame, thanks to imaging integrated in the surgical pipeline and thanks to the use of robots. Today, surgical robots are a, a little bit different, I would say. Uh, and uh, in the next slide, I want to show you a kind of classification, macro classification of integrated robotics in the clinical sector. So surgical assistant robot is what we see today around. Uh, this is a gold standard of surgical robotic procedure, the Da Vinci XI system. This is a, a teleoperated robot. So the level of autonomy of this robot is teleoperation. And this robot that is, I would say, pretty much consolidated in a clinical scenario is uh, using a master console for moving, you know, teleoperate uh, uh, slave uh, robots, slave, uh, let's say, tools, uh, improving the dexterity of the medical doctor in a very immersive way. The doctor is immersed in the console and is manipulating, is translating his or her hands on the robot itself, improving accuracy, removing a few issues such as tremor or let's say precision. So it's like to translate uh, the hands of the medical doctor into the patient cavity for a very precise and reliable uh, surgery. Another uh, ca classification of robot I want to tell you is wearable robots. Wearable robots is uh, something very important for supporting and for enhancing the capabilities, the functionalities of the, of the user, of the practitioner, so on the patient and medical side. And the exoskeleton, yes, can improve this, but also can restore, can support restoration of natural uh, and smooth, let's say, functionality of the patient, and can also support rehabilitation of, uh, of patient, creating, uh, let's say, automatic uh, programs for restoring and rehabilitate uh, the functionality of the patient, tracking what is the improvement in the, let's say, clinical rehabilitation pipeline. 
Implantable robots, another very important category of, of medical robots. Implantable robots, an artificial end, is uh, even more important if we consider this prosthesis connected by intraneural uh, interfaces, electrodes, to the human in a bionic paradigm. So this end, such as the lower limb, is uh, a bionic uh, element that uh, restores uh, the functionality of the patient that may lost uh, the hands or the legs. And uh, that important issue, let's say, is uh, going closer to a medicine that is uh, a bionic, following an abionic approach. More in uh, going ahead, social and service robots, an important element of the next hospital of the future. And uh, uh, Francesco Ferro will talk about that in the next presentation. Uh, automation and logistic, it's important to provide to the hospital uh, means for improving logistic, transportation, uh, medicine, let's say, um, let's say medicine, transportation as well. But what I would like to focus with this category of robot is the automation in the healthcare sector. It's important to track, to be precise in moving, let's say, samples, uh, blood samples, and any kind of bio, let's say, samples we got. It's important because in order to manage huge amount of data, but more important, to reduce as much as possible errors. This is an important aspect we have to take in mind, reducing error in the clinical healthcare, let's say pipeline 100%. Uh, we can do that uh, using automation. We can do that tracking and having data integrated and let's say with specific standard. I will move now to provide a few insights about robotic technologies. And I would say that MAMS, for sure revolutionize the uh, way of sensing and making a robot computing uh, or a machine to compute information and huge amount of information. But what in the last year really provided a disruptive change is the, is the use of collaborative robots. A robot that cannot be used, uh, I mean, can use in the industrial sector as well, it is, but uh, can, uh, let's say, work uh, in contact with uh, people, in contact with patients, and even more if it is uh, enhanced with, uh, uh, I would say, is enhanced with uh, more information, more sensor can improve the perception of the environment, the perception of people around, and be a real robot companion, a mate for, let's say, supporting the daily clinical tasks. We cannot do anything without uh, adding intelligence, artificial intelligence to our collaborative machine. So artificial intelligence uh, is something very important that we have to add uh, in the next, let's say, devices, medical tools of the future. What you can see in this video is an automatic, it's just an example, an automatic polyp detection that has to be used not for removing the doctor for the clinical practice, but for supporting the decision-making of the doctor in making the best diagnosis and let's say tracking what maybe he's not able to see and uh, that can support uh, in a, an offline manner as well, a better diagnosis, a more reliable diagnosis. For sure, we have trends and open issues what I wanted to highlight in this presentation is the introduction and the use of soft robots. Soft robots uh, is for sure a collaborative robot, but it provides intrinsically the capabilities of being gentle, of being safe, of being, let's say, appropriate in interacting with the user and be compliant, uh, adapt itself to the environment. Let's you know, think about that choosing materials, you can use the robot as a kind of mechanical switch for avoiding uh, acting force over threshold on uh, very fragile and delicate organs. So this robot may have in the material itself uh, sensing and let's say intelligence uh, 
through the use of specific materials. Everything has to be connected and we need standards because the big amount of data, the huge amount of data has to be managed. I said standard because uh, I don't think that the solution is to have a huge and huge server to process and heat data. But what I think is important to provide to our machine, good data. So through protocol, through specific standard, to avoid the paradigm of garbage in, garbage out. We need to provide good data to our machine for having a good process. Otherwise, it's difficult that our artificial neural network will converge in the right way. Everything has to be managed with the protection of sensitive information. Uh, and so cyber security is absolutely very important. How to manage that? Not thinking about robotics as an engineering science, and that's it, but enlarging the scenario, adding other principles, other sciences in this, uh, uh, let's say, in this, um, in this pot, let's say, okay? And ethics, uh, regulation, is something that we have introduced. So what I would like to say that he health robots can be the collectors of the different sciences uh, and all together we can create the next generation robots for the next generation hospital. And going more and more in the idea of a predictive, preventive and personalized and participating medicine. Our goal is not to just improve the surgical robot at the, let's say, surgeon's bed. We want to avoid that at, at the maximum we can, because uh, if you can longitudinally diagnose, analyze, monitor the person, so predicting and preventing pathologies with a personalized and participating manner, because I want to be part of my healthcare, let's say, uh, scenario, we reduce, uh, let's say, people going to the uh, surgical bed, uh, and we can create a new paradigm of longitudinal healthcare, where every day, based on what I eat, based on what I, I breathe, wait on, based on what I drink, based on the probiotics, the medicine I get, uh, I can, let's say, uh, help my health day by day. And so staying in the right, let's say, health up to the end without having a very let's say low uh, uh rise down before before the end how the au odin project will integrate robotics uh, here i will be very very short but we want to add uh, at least three pillars one is the e workers so enhanced hospital workers hospital workers with novel digital skills that uh, he, she uh, will apply to support and improve their daily work. Thanks to augmented reality, artificial intelligence, 3D printing for more precise and accessible surgery. So giving to the doctor uh, something more, digital skills to perform a better, let's say diagnosis, therapy and surgery day by day. Together with the enhanced robot, so hospital robot with advanced perception functions, extreme connectivity features, i.e. reasoning capabilities. So we want to benefit from uh, automatons to uh, provide the best logistic, uh, best patient care, and also practitioner care. Finally, enhanced infrastructure, because as you get from my presentation, intelligent spaces are very needed, medical instruments and technology for enabling what? hospital processes, providing pharmacy, distributed drugs, everything connected, everything integrated in an infrastructure that will be enhanced by the result of the project. I want to conclude my presentation saying that we need to make the step ahead with a new disruptive change. And I think that this project will make the difference. Let us be inspired. Here you see the father of robotics, Joseph Engelberger, close to Isaac Asimov. Okay. Science fiction can absolutely inspire grand challenges. Looking around ourselves, looking around the world we have around, sorry for, the, for what I said, the play of words, can really make for us the new step ahead for a new disruptive change. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, pleasure for me to be here.
Thank you very much, uh, Gastone, also for being in time and uh, for providing a very good overview. Actually, your last slide is particularly important because uh, when all this field started, uh, I was part of it, uh, the, the doctors who dared to make a, a, a small incision, minimally invasive surgery, were considered as crazy guys. And we, who in, uh, proposed the use of robots in medicine, in particular in surgery, were also considered as crazy guys. Uh, so uh, it is important to uh, look ahead, to have a vision, and of course, to make very practical things. Thank you very much. By the way, I would like to uh, encourage uh, all the attendees uh, to pose uh, questions uh, if they wish. Uh, there is a, a button to, and, and you can ask your questions on, on, on Zoom. Okay, so now, perfectly on time, it's time to introduce uh, Marta, Marta, who is uh, uh, giving a uh, presentation. Hi everyone, I will just share my screen. Okay. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Marta Millet and I'm uh, an engineer in robotic automation. Um, we are a Spanish company based in, in Valencia and involved in the in the Odin project. Uh, me, I'm an industrial engineer and I worked previously in robotics in Germany, in KUKA, and also in, uh, related to the medical sector. Uh, I was in Autobock in, also in Germany, working with uh, motors and uh, prosthesis integration. So my role here is to have uh, to put a little context in robotic logistics, well, what is now up to date. And what are the new the new directions to follow, and also what everything that is related to logistics and hospitals, and how robotics has integrated it uh, so far. So I think in robotic logistics there are three main uh, main pillars, so to say, that is autonomous autonomous autonomy uh, that the robot is plug and play, and to be able to work in a collaborative and environment and to be able to connect to the company's uh, network. So autonomy is a key aspect because uh, we believe that the uh, robots need to be completely autonomous so that you can trust them and uh, be independent from workers. So they can work by themselves and be as minimum controlled as possible. Uh, we think that robotic, robots themselves, they are a very complex system related with mechanics, electronics, and and many, many different components that need to be completely integrated. And this complex system is usually very difficult to program and to commission or to implement. So one of the keys to have, a, have success in logistics is to have a plug and play solution so that a, a person with not a lot of knowledge in electronics or programming or mechanics is able to, to perform and control a, a daily task of a robot. Another key aspect for robot logistics and in general uh, robots nowadays is that they are collaborative, so they can work together with with the different workers and machines that are involved in the daily activities of a company. The main challenge, as I said before, there is the integration in the in the company's network that they can be uh, like com combination of activities between the workers that are already there and the new robots that are ahead to come, and that every robot is modular and adaptable to the to the customer's needs, and yeah, that you don't have to change the environment or the different aspects that are already existing in the company to implement a robot. It's only helpful, that doesn't cause any possible problems, and that it's for sure safe. So here you can see a practical example of a robotic robot that is uh, working in the in the logistics area. Uh, it, it's used to monitor and and control the different aspects of a retail store, and it's as you can see connected to the to what was already existing in the company. So the different 
the different systems and connection and machines that are already there. And they are collaborative with the different persons that are working. So it, it only provides a uh, useful thing. So it, it doesn't cause a problem in the, in the daily activities or it's uh, a problem you have to deal with. And it's, uh, as I said before, it's very important that it's safe because uh, humans will be continuously dealing with uh, having, yeah, having different interactions with the robot. And it's uh, very important that uh, you can trust uh, the different machines that will be involved. Okay, so uh, related to logistics, so the logistics in hospitals, I found a, a very nice quote about Landry and Bolio, that's uh, a researcher related to logistics. And he said that hospital logistics is a set of design, planning, and execution of activities which will enable the purchase, inventory management, and replenishment of goods and services surrounding the provision of to patients. And here I found three main aspects that I wanted to, to highlight that are uh, for robotic logistics, the inventory management, the replenishment of, of goods, and the provision of medical services to patients. Uh, I would like to enhance that uh, this comes also with a compl complexity increase because inventory management is much easier than provision to patients because when you have to interact not only with the workers of the, of the hospital or, of the, or the medical people, but also with the patients, there is a, a critical point there that there must, be, must be addressed and will be a challenge in the, in the next years. So the first one is the, the inventory management. So here is an example that, uh, that the yeah, robotic was dealing with. I will explain it also a bit better later. But this the inventory management in the in the yeah in a hospital with the material that is required in the different plants of the hospital. So this is uh, mainly an easier task for robotics, I would say, because there's a, there's not a lot of human interaction. There is no patients at all involved. So the idea is to have 24-hour good transportation. And the good thing about robotics is that you can get from them as much data as you want. The key point here is to use this data well, and it's, it can be used for future and future improvements of a project or for continuous improvement, as Gastone said before, including artificial intelligence. intelligence. So the next point, as I said in the, in the quote, is replenishment of food, goods. This is, so to say, a higher level of, of interaction with the robot because here in the floors, there can be also different workers in, of, the, of the hospital. There is a higher human interaction as in the previous case, and the environment is changing more because there can be like different obstacles, dynamic obstacles that might appear during the course of the day. But the key here is that the robot can interact with the environment, avoiding the obstacles that might appear, and also with the different systems or machines, like for example, an, an elevator. For the replenishment of goods, it's usually uh, more than uh, one robot involved because you have many different things that you want to, to transfer from one way to another. And for here, it's required uh, a fleet management implementation that is optimal for the, for the resources and the different wave level in a, in a hospital. And last but not least, the third point and most critical point about robotic logistics in hospitals is the provision of medical services to patients. This one is, I would say that's the main challenge of robotic logistics right now, because here you will have a robot a patient interaction with the robots. And here there are different key points like the patients that maybe they don't want to, or they are more, more, they, are not that sure to trust the machine instead of a human. There are different aspects that need to be worked on in aspect of ethics, uh, psychology, and also, of course, uh, machine safety. This is an example that the robotic was involved in a, in a project, in a, in a European project that was related to the patient interaction and the, the robot you see most to the right. This one was equipped with different, ma different, uh, different machines or different medical devices that would able to monitor a patient. So the, for an easy and fast diagnosis, the, the robot was moving from one room to the other from the hospital instead of having this set in every room. So it was the idea of having an, 
an efficient way of measuring the patients and also to to have less cost in equipment related to yeah, medical devices that are always a challenge because they are very expensive. So yeah, for the vision in the robotics in the next year, I I saw different different articles. One of them was uh, where I found this this very interesting picture that was dividing the robotic in hospitals in uh, telemedicine, assistance, and disinfection. That is being increased a lot, as we all know, for like from the recent pandemic because they were it was more like a trend to do robots to the infection everyone every robotic company was involved in this kind of task and the other one is telemedicine that i was showing the example uh, before with the three robotic robots this telemedicine is yeah is a good advantage in the social distancing that's also been a trend lately because of the covid and what we i wanted to focus in this presentation was the logistics tasks and assistance of uh, medical equipment and delivery. This one was the key aspect of the, that they wanted to present in the presentation. So the expected tasks for logistics to sum, to sum up are the delivery of material between the different areas of the hospital, delivery of medicine, the transport of medical equipment, and also will be in the future that we are already working on transport of patients themselves. Mm. There was a, a, a research in the opinion of the different people involved in the medical tasks that they were asked what the features, what features should a robot have for assistance and logistics. And as you can say, and as I, as I was advancing a bit, the most, one of the most, the most important aspects are safety. So that the robot and the person or patients of the workers are completely safe. There's no there's no one gets scared. It's completely trustful the machine that it can provide alerts that it's related also to safety, but also for monitoring patients. That it can be the 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 medical the doctor can go faster where there is an emergency because a robot is monitoring the 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 patient, and of course to provide support in the in the daily activities of the of the hospital. So I wanted to give to to end an example of robotic logistics in hospitals. How we as a company have been has dealt with this challenge in the last years. So we have uh, I think we have a few robots installed in us in the hospital La Fe of Valencia. It's a very very new and very very big hospital in here in in our city. It's uh, two hundred. 60,000 square meters, there are 6,000 daily workers there. And as a, to give you like an overview on how big it is, there are 5,000 births every year and 30,000 surgeries every year in the hospital. So it's very big. So the, the internal transportation is really an issue. And yeah, this is a, a project we did. I think you saw a few images before, but the robots were in the in the lower part of the hospital, transporting the, the different goods and interacting with the with the with very a few people that were more or less controlling. And yes, this is uh, they were transporting material from from one place to another. And this is our Agus robot. And that was it. So thank you very much. I'm uh, Marta Millet. Um, here's my email for any questions you might have or whatever you might need. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marta. I think uh, your your uh, uh, presentation raised uh, many many uh, points, uh, many issues. Uh, about acceptability, about the sustainability, about uh, the real deployment of this solution in the hospitals. So I'm pretty sure that during the question and answer session, there will be many, there will be opportunities to ask you uh, more in detail uh, what is your perception about Okay, thank you very much also for being uh, on time. And uh, now we have the third speaker, uh, Francesco Ferro um, from PAL Robotics. And uh, Francesco will talk about uh, humanoids uh, and about uh, robotic for uh, services in hospital.
thank you to give us the opportunity to explain a little bit our efforts in, uh, during this pandemic period and uh, what we are doing about in, uh, in the healthcare system. So here is more or less the resume about the presentation, so that we'll explain our effort in this, this field. But before that, we will do a, a little review about the survey robotics in healthcare. Then we will explain some solution and also some project where we were involved in this, during this period. So let's start with just one slide about what we are doing. So like Paolo already said, we are specialized in human and robotics, but we are not doing only this. So we are doing a lot of effort also in social robotics that is connected with healthcare, especially for the elderly or companion robots. And uh, in logistics, also in the hospital, in order to move around different stuff from for, uh, for to help in the nursery and, and the hospital in general. And mobility is the Tiago robot that could also integrate not only uh, the movement of the mobile basis, but also interact with the hand one or two arms in, uh, in different sectors. So uh, about that, uh, like I said at the, at the beginning, I would like to make a little review about the different uh, applications also in the healthcare system. And here you can see uh, this is taken by the EFR Federation of Robotics uh, about the different use of the healthcare for the service robotics for them. So here you can see a little list about where our know-how of robotics could help in the health system. And so here you can see a lot of different uh, fields, like the development and production of drugs, the pharmacy dispensing, uh, the surgery and rehabilitation, and, uh, and the things that we are doing. And also, I want to mention that uh, just in March, we had a special issue about robotics in IEEE, where also we had uh, uh, different use cases. Uh, and, uh, and here I want to mention uh, our Codidino that is from Rome, where we did uh, some, uh, some different uh, um, tests in the hospital in order to try to help Korea in the logistics scenario and also in the disinfecting uh, in, the, in the hospital center. But apart of that, let me explain our effort in the interlogistics part. So uh, the idea is very easy, like also Marta will explain, is to implement something easy and, um, and to, to optimize the resources in order to help to minimize the time of the people, you know, especially in the healthcare, in order to stay more with the patients and less on the logistic part. So about that, we have to to make a differentiation between the AGV and MR, probably you already know about that, but the idea is that we have to use in service robotics more and more MR in order to have less invasive in the space, uh, so we don't need to have any guy or whatever. So our view is that we will not use, no, we will not change completely the hospital in order to use more and more robots, but it's the opposite way around. So the robot has to be more and more intelligence, also thanks to the AI, in order to provide more and more service in autonomous way. So uh, about that, we did a different uh, version of our travel base in order to help. And, uh, and we did this in a real scenario, and we designed this kind of, of platform and also we are collaborating with some partners in order to make this and introduce this in different pilots and also we are doing some pilots from by our side. And here is more or less the different things that we can do, but here we have to focus on the labs and the hospital part that are important for, for the healthcare. Uh, but we are not to, to underestimate it also the offices that also there are a lot of offices inside the healthcare system and also the warehousing where we have to store the different medicine of the different part. And so the channel specification you can check on the internet, so it's not so difficult to find. But our technology is based and the navigation is based on the laser base, so on 2D. And we have the possibility to customize the different solution, also to implement different sensor. That is one of the lack uh, at the moment for the robotics in order to to put more and more sensor in order to give more um, possibility to this platform to, to help. 
and, uh, and this is just something that you can check on, on the data sheet of the different providers of these technologies. But let me pass to the area project that we did during the COVID that is called the FAST AV. So it's, uh, the idea was to make a fast deployment of the Java base in order to reduce the virus spread and also to try to free up the healthcare personnel. So this was the most important part. And uh, we, this project was financed by the Digital Innovation Hero. And we did this deployment in collaboration with another company, Italian company, that uh, gave us the access to the Triton camera in order to make a better place recognition. And, um, and uh, this was the three different challenges. And here, I don't know why it's not starting the video, but here we have different video where you can see the robot in action. And uh, you can see, for example, the second challenge, uh, the robot it was uh, in the in the corridor that it was a real hospital in, uh, in, in at that moment where the COVID it was very very <laughs> difficult and uh, and also the other part it was the, the different uh, uh, challenge about the ethical issue that uh, that this kind of solution can uh, can raise up and uh, another important part also in this project it was to have a food tray in order to to give the food on the patient room so the positive people that was with COVID in order to minimize the possible uh, uh, contagious with, with the nursery and so the robot it was just giving the food to patients that uh, that are still able to take their their tray in order to food but uh, it helped a lot in order to give the nursery to assist the real patients and so just to, to, to help in all the logistic part of, of the hospital. And um, another thing that we did is the transportation of sensible goods. And so here we have, we did these two real uh, projects in two hospitals here in Barcelona. One is the hospital clinic, the other one is Badalona uh, Hospital. And now we are splitting up uh, to different other uh, hospitals in the region. And uh, the idea is also to try to, to give the robot the, the, the possibility to send around the different uh, material, hospital material. And in a situation called safety conveyor. And so you can make some passwords and so the robots just go around the, the corridor of the hospital, uh, just delivering the different uh, part. And um, like I said, the different benefits I already spoke about, about this, but one important issue that uh, I think that robotics community has to try to solve is uh, we have to push more and more this usability. So uh, we have to try to adapt our, uh, our solution for the real environment and uh, try to push the, the fact that the robot, this robot has to be easy to use. And this is the big effort that, uh, that we have to go to them. And uh, another project that was very important in this period was about the cavity based disinfection. Okay, so the idea is very easy. So we are expecting robotics. We just collaborate with another company here in Catalonia that producing the UCD. And uh, the solution has to be, uh, has to disinfect autonomously the, the different environment uh, in order to make a free COVID environment for the people. And so here there's some technical specification, but uh, we are not, we didn't do only the platform in this case, but we are doing real uh, disinfection. And uh, here you can see also a video where we are disinfecting offices because it's another important part in order to also help the office environment to don't have to, to be free COVID. And, uh, and also we did the same in, um, in hospital. So I think that in the next slides we have, uh, um, this is something in a hotel. And, uh, and the idea is to uh, decontaminate the area and uh, reduce the panic um, of the people sometimes about this pandemic part. And uh, the solution is very easy to use and uh, is autonomous. The only important thing is that this solution has to work uh, without people around. So this is the important part because 
At the moment, uh, this solution is with UDC, and so could be dangerous for people. And but we are also testing other different solutions that could be used also with people. And so we are working with it. And this is our own ongoing project. Yeah. And about the usability that I just mentioned at the beginning, uh, it's quite easy. And so we, we just make a big effort in order to make this very easy and make four single step in order to, to have this disinfection done uh, in, in an easy way. And uh, last but not the least, let me mention other collaborative projects that are ongoing where we are involved in the healthcare system. Here there's a full map about our project, but the healthcare is just the first column. And uh, in the ongoing project, the European Union just asked us to just change different use cases in order to, to solve other, the problem of pandemic. And so helping also use cases for the, with, the, with the different solution that we have. Uh, like the Spring Project. Spring Project just started uh, the beginning of the last year with a lot of university. And the, the, the goal of this project is to use they are involved inside the hospital, especially in Paris. And uh, what we need, for example, changing the use cases, like I said before, is we integrate also a thermal camera in order to constantly uh, monitoring the temperature of uh, patients or also the people that are around, and also introduce in the torso of the robot a gel dispenser in order to touch the screen in a safe mode. And so this is the things that we are doing, and for sure, like a service robots, also making entertainment, guiding, and uh, most medical appointment, uh, and all these kind of things. And so, um, another project that I would like to mention is SHAPES, that is with the elderly sector. And so, we did just uh, two weeks ago um, a real rehearsal in an elderly care in uh, Mallorca, and, uh, and the idea of this is to use the, the ARI robot to help the elderly care of people. So uh, we integrate a lot of technology and, um, and for example, like games, cognitive games that uh, looks very easy, but is very important for the people, but uh, also chat box, the possibility of the deliberation and, uh, and, and also the thermal camera to monitor also the elderly uh, part. So I think that uh, I'm going out of time. So I would like to, to finish the presentation with uh, a simple message that uh, we try to make our big effort in order to improve the logistic uh, optimization of the time and resources, especially for the elderly uh, part and also the healthcare in general, because this COVID-19 is, is a right to stay in the sense that we have to, to try to use the 6 solution in order to, to improve our, our daily life and the uh, service robotics is, is here in order to enhance the people quality of life. So thank you for your presentation and now if you have uh, any questions, let's see. Last. Thank you very much. Um, Really, Francesco, very, very uh, exciting presentation like the ones uh, of uh, the other colleagues. So, uh, I would uh, again encourage uh, the audience to take the opportunity to have uh, such distinguished uh, speakers and experts uh, to ask questions. But uh, while waiting for uh, your question, I would like to start by asking a question by myself and by encouraging also uh, the colleagues of the panel to ask the whole question. Uh, I would like to ask, start with uh, Gastone by um, pointing out, uh, uh, since uh, this was the uh, flavor he gave to his presentation, what, what are, in your opinion, the, the frontiers of uh, research that are uh, really posing uh, bottlenecks and at the same time representing opportunities. I would like to ask you to give a brief uh, answer so that uh, we can have more questions. But uh, what is your feeling as, as a professor and as a researcher uh, about what is really uh, needed 
to overcome uh, the obstacle. And then we will see what are the obstacles uh, uh, by asking to asking Marta and Francesco to uh, give their uh, I, I opinion about the uh, opportunities for uh, real uh, applications. But maybe you can point out uh, your research uh, point of view. Thank you very much, Professor Dario. I, I really appreciate that question. I have actually uh, two, two answers. One uh, is, uh, I would say, more high level, uh, so not uh, technology driven. That, so my, my first answer is uh, what we really need uh, and what is actually the, I don't want to call bottleneck, but the real need uh, is uh, integration of uh, competencies and different skills in the field of uh, robotics. But not just because uh, we need uh, something more, it's true, we need, for example, uh, specific regulations, uh, we need uh, uh, understanding how to certify uh, the quality of our system, and uh, not uh, at uh, our, our, our house, but in general to have a standard and uh, common guidelines for uh, uh, so a protocol, at least a European protocol to test uh, our machines. Because if I move, uh, if I want to test and qualify my medical robot in Italy, I have, you know, the ethical committee with specific rule. If I go to France, there is another one. And that's something that I think it's very important to state, uh, having common guidelines for testing robotics. Because in terms of uh, an engineering perspective, thanks to the community that developed the uh, ROS uh, uh, robotic operating system and different general infrastructure, open source infrastructure, at one point when we meet, uh, with Marta, Francesco, we said, what do we use? We use ROS, what's the matter? And, uh, and we can make things fast. But when we have to understand how to test a system, it depends, <laughs> you know, it depends about the different regulations. So this is more at a high level um, point, uh, more technically talking, uh, um, sensors really, you know, make a step ahead uh, and robotics in general. What I'm still waiting for is, uh, is you know, a very small uh, battery that will provide high energy. Okay, sorry for this. I, I simplify very much now, but energy is something very important because I'm quite sure that Marta and Francesco, when they design the robot, they evaluate what they have to do, what they need to do for how much time and uh, charging the robot is, I mean, sometimes the, the main issue to face with. No? So energy is something that uh, if it will receive a push ahead, uh, I, I would appreciate as an engineer. I, I don't know, Prof, if... Uh, uh, no. uh, yeah, of course, uh, I will uh, ask you again. i give you some time to think about uh, maybe more precisely because, no, no, of course, it is precise what you said, but uh, consider that uh, what we are now using is a technology that was developed 30 years ago, more or less. Uh, <coughs> and, and this is what... Uh, fact, the time that is taken to, for example, translate uh, a very smart uh, joint, uh, multi degrees of freedom joint like uh, the Da Vinci into something that is really usable just to mention a case. So uh, my point to you is that since the universities are working at TR a low TRL, so from zero, <laughs> let's say, to maybe four or five. So what are the next challenges that could fuel the, the next wave of, uh, of robotics? Maybe uh, I will ask you uh, just later and uh, maybe ask uh, uh, Marta instead. Uh, Marta, Marta is working at higher TRL, you know, in the domain of innovation from uh, five to seven, maybe eight. So in your opinion, what are the uh, main obstacles you presented already, just to summarize? Are regulations like Gastone pointed out, uh, or uh, insurance, uh, risk, uh, cost? Uh, what is in your experience? Uh, what is uh, the, the, the main obstacle to the deployment uh, of uh, our technology in real uh, hospitals? Uh, 
So, uh, of course, the uh, regulations, as uh, Gastone was mentioning, uh, in other technical or manufacturing areas, there is more standardized uh, regulation in all Europe, I would say. And the sanitary aspect is always a bit independent and a bit more uh, difficult to change and to innovate. And, and it's completely understandable. It's a, a very sensitive area, a very sensitive uh, aspect where the workers are uh, need to be super precise, and the trust is is the main factor. I mean, for example, in in manufacturing, there is more importance in times and productivity and so on than in than in the sanitary aspect. In the sanitary aspect, uh, number one priority is trust and almost hundred percent of uh, effectiveness. In manufacturing, you don't care that. I mean, you don't care. It's not that big importance that one every thousand screws is uh, bad done or they fall down or whatever in the sanitary aspect the the success rate must be very very high and that's that's i think one of the reasons why why robotics is that it's a bit uh, it's confusing because robotics te usually tend to be more more precise than humans of course but they it's hard to believe that. So I guess that's one of the main aspects for also for regulations that are slowly coming. And I guess this European bridge, they help a lot that we have like a common view, all the different partners from all the different countries to have a common view in safety, security, and implementation possibilities uh, for robotics. So yeah, I would say that the standardization of regulation is one of the main aspects but also that it's closely related the trust and being open to integrate in the daily activities and not only the thing is there are many test projects and and yeah, examples where you want to you put a robot in a hospital for two weeks uh, do a few videos and that's it but in the real world in the daily activities it's still very hard that a hospital or a medical entity sacrifices or invests a lot of money and development in integrating them. So I guess also there is a bit of, of lack of trust, but I think it's it's coming and all these different projects and all these examples of put a robot two weeks in your hospital or this is visibility. And it's, I think it's coming, it's slowly then production, manufacturing and all the other sectors, but I think uh, we will see it uh, more soon than late. So yeah, that's my opinion in this aspect. Thank you very much, Marta. Actually, you know, <clears throat> of course, uh, we are fighting, and Odin is also fighting, to translate uh, research excellence into real opportunities for uh, uh, customers, uh, for companies, and this is uh, really uh, crucial. Uh, there are examples, for example, that I like to make. For example, consider the case of Kiva robots, you know, all of us know. Well, so Kiva Robot Robotics uh, was established in Switzerland, uh, and uh, uh, Raffaello D'Andrea and his team, and they sold actually Kiva to Amazon. Amazon opened uh, Amazon Robotics, and today it's impressive to see the new uh, Kiva-based robots in uh, logistics. Actually, they are. I think this is one of the most. Uh, uh, impressive success story showing how logistics can rapidly uptake uh, innovation. Of course, the hospital is not a warehouse, we know. Uh, on the other hand, for example, uh, in the hospital, there is another sector that is getting a tremendous uh, uh, impact from robotics, that is the automation of uh, analysis, for example you know, blood, brand, uh, uh, and this kind of sample is uh, being uh, very deeply automated. So meaning that uh, there is uh, uh, a positive attitude by also the, um, the, the authorities, you know, the leaders, the managers of hospital to uh, consider innovation that are truly uh, uh, useful. So, Testing bad, the regulations, uh, better technology. Francesco, your, your turn. What do you think about that? Well, it's a good question. So it's very open. But, <laughs> but uh, the, I, I have to say that uh, what Gaston and also Marza mentioned are very important for the real environment. So uh, we are speaking a lot about robotics. 
and uh, we are trying to push and try to make a lot of solution. But uh, from the other hand, if you go to the hospital, there's not so much automation. So you can see that the, the process is still manual. So the trust is one of the things that Martha mentioned is, is, is completely true, uh, and also regulation. But uh, in my opinion, it's also missing, uh, uh, let me say, the, the way of doing this kind of solution really accessible. So the, the, the usability is one of the part. And another important, very important thing is that uh, from an engineering point of view, usually we focus in the fact that we have to have a clear use case that will never change. And in a, in a real world, in the dynamic environment, we have to have solution that has to change based on what is important at that moment in the hospital. So our solution needs, in some, in some cases, some AI in order to be uh, more flexible and adapt a little bit more on the real use cases. Making an example, a robot, simple robot, like, uh, like Marta is showing, you know, moving the robot, or our robot that is moving in the hospital, then if we change the configuration of the hospital, so we change, for example, the bank or whatever, sometimes uh, the robot is get lost. So this is something that we have to to manage. So the robot, robot has to have also the opportunity to learn how to uh, work in better for the real use cases. And uh, these are the two points that are uh, attached to point. So from one side that make it easy, very easy for the people that have no idea about, so don't have a PhD on robotics to use a robot. So this is one point in the use because it's, it's, it's crucial. And from the other side, a robot that could adapt to the different environment in an in a easy way. Thank you. Actually, uh, one possibility that is happening is to proceed uh, gradually. So, for example, uh, uh, robotics is now well established in, uh, in the surgical room. Why? Because it is under the control of humans. Uh, in reality, most robots are teleoperated or uh, only moderately autonomous. Uh, the second, point, second area is uh, the laboratory automation or even uh, the, the logistics for hospitals. These cases are controlled environment in which robots could move uh, quickly and freely. The real point, uh, like uh, you pointed out, Francesco, is when robots and humans are in contact. That is the uh, point, uh, is the real challenge, of course, and not only the hospitals everywhere. In fact, the very same idea of robot companions is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, there. So what do you think about, maybe I go back to Gastone about the challenges again. And so what will be, because universities must conceive what will be uh, important for industry, maybe 10 years from now, uh, uh, but also what, what are uh, the challenges in your yeah. people about this uh, human-robot interaction that turns out to be very important during the COVID, and that, by the way, could also open uh, very, very broad opportunities for industry, for example, in the area of aging population. So in uh, co-housing, uh, in areas in which uh, uh, frail elderly live, for example, or people with uh, pathologies needed rehabilitation. Those are also supervised environments in which uh, other generations of robots could also uh, uh, work and find uh, uh, enormous applications. Uh, so also beyond the hospital itself, but based on the knowledge uh, acquired in the hospital environment. What do you think, Gastone? Yeah, uh, actually, uh, your question uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a very good question. And uh, my answer is, is, is pretty simple. Actually, uh, we, we have to perform uh, a, a longitudinal health care. Uh, so when you said uh, supervise the health of people outside the hospital, I think it's, it's, a, it's a must for this kind of healthcare scenario. So uh, monitoring. So at the end, uh, what I would like to, to see in the future, transparent robots that are you know uh, units that 
can monitor, not invasively, our health. That doesn't mean we have pathologies, just how we live, what is the quality of our life at home when I'm just walking around, and then for sure when I'm at the hospital. And all this information has to be fused and provided with decision-making algorithms to the, to the doctor. I, I'm, I'm making a parallel because I know, Prof, that you like pretty much uh, Formula One. And if, we, if you think about how was the steering wheel of Nuvolari, and how is the steering wheel of uh, Hamilton now, it's completely different. But if you think about, you know, the system for hearing the beating of your heart, uh, stethoscope, is actually the same. It just, just the design slightly change. But what I'm saying is that we need to provide eye uh, based eye integrated tool to the doctors. The doctors at the end will be, has the surgeon using the Da Vinci system. It will be the actor, it will be the main user, but we can support the doctor to, uh, with the information. So again, I'm pretty much general, but uh, adding sensors and, uh, and let's say robotics in the daily life uh, for, for getting information, for processing information, for saying to Gastone, hey, you have to walk a little bit more because your liver is not feeling so well. It's something that we save my life uh, before having steatosis and then the rest of, you know? And uh, if I can add another point more scientifically driven, what I think can really change uh, the way of performing diagnosis is uh, obtaining biomarkers from unknown scenarios. You know, I, you know, I like very much omics. So the science of omics, genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and uh, why this? Because thanks to the analysis of uh, our, let's say, internal environment. So, I mean, guys, we have 100 uh, trillions of bacteria in our body, more than the cells. So what do they do there? Okay. And uh, I'm not saying something that has not been evaluated scientifically. If you go to Scopus and write microbiota, you see a kind of trend in the last year that is amazing because the, let's say, uh, how the... Um, our cells or our bacteria, our, our microbes are changing inside our body is making an evalu evaluation, a monitor, an onset of a, of a potential pathology. And if we monitor them with the micro robots, with meso robots, with system robotics in general, before that is too late, uh, we can really make you know, the, the trend of the quality of life very high until the end. And so this is my, my idea. In yeah, I think this, this is a very, very good point uh, that I think we should also consider in a strategic manner because uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, Europeans prim primarily, industry and researchers uh, and uh, also hospital managers. So we have to deal with the reality today, but we have also to consider uh, the future. Uh, I agree with Gastone that the onyx, uh, and not only, uh, and, and the pandemics are changing the perspective. There may be in the future, there may, may be a completely different structure of hospitals. You know, we are talking about hospitals. What will be hospital? It is likely that there will be a limited number of extremely specialized, high quality, high technology intensive uh, hospitals uh, with, uh, with an external layers of uh, hospitals or similar uh, that uh, will uh, sort of filter uh, many patients. In addition, there will be much more in prevention, for example. So a different healthcare system that would come and obviously we in Europe want to be leaders in designing this because our system is an excellent healthcare system. We want to maintain this for citizens, but also for industry. So, uh, Marta, Francesco, maybe Sergio also 
would you like to uh, add your considerations on this uh, scenario? So how would you see uh, the, the coming future uh, based on the innovation? What do you think, by the way, are the main innovations that are needed? What would you like to ask uh, uh, professors and uh, researchers to develop that uh, is uh, uh, needed uh, or, or, or it's just a matter of uh, deployment, cost, uh, legal issues, uh, standards, and so on. But what, what is your opinion? Right, thank you, thank you, um, Olo. Um, I will. I like to add some comments and perhaps a, a, a question for the floor. Um, um, first of all, I'm. I'm, I'm Congratulations for the, very, uh, the speaker for a very, very in, interesting presentation, and I would say even more interesting uh, debate and exchange of, of opinions that uh, uh, you are uh, uh, conducting. So um, I think that um, uh, when you ask about uh, how we will see, I, I would like to come to the framework of the the the, the Odin project. It really, Odin was funded with this idea. Um, we have to, to, to balance two things. And I see from the presentations, uh, very interesting uh, elements that uh, comes to me uh, in order to understand and in order to, to shape the evolution of, of Odin, okay? Um, I see, for instance, um, uh, logistics, uh, um, uh, robots, logistic area in, in hospital and the practical use of oil. I would say that uh, probably is the most, uh, let's say, mature sector that uh, we intend to uh, incorporate uh, in, the, in, the, in the hospital, even though it is already incorporated in some hospital, as we see examples. And other areas which are really futuristic, but uh, uh, participate of the continuum of care that was mentioned by, by, by Gastone in, in several of uh, his interventions um, that are related, for instance, to the um, uh, support for people in doing things from uh, a companion uh, robots uh, to assistant robots to exoskeletal robots, okay? and to prosthesis robots. So there is a, a, a very broad uh, range of possibilities that are working together to assist people. So in robots, in, 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 in logistics, we are assisting robots assisting processes in the hospital in connection with the uh, e-workers as uh, we see it in, 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 in Odin and others, a, a very broad uh, range of new generation of, of, of robots and technologies assisting uh, people. And these people can be workers, professionals, or uh, 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 patients, caregivers, etc. So for me, um, 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 Odin for one part needs to keep the long-term vision of what is going to come, what, how we are going to prepare the field for the, for the new technologies to come will have a, 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 an ambient where they can develop a, a, a within the, the hospital. But in the other side of Odin, which is an innovation, so innovation is when you implement a solutions based on the innovative technology in the real world. I mean, one of the questions, one of the comments from Marta was that one of the difficulty is really how we are going to go from the pilot in a hospital to mainstream. So what are today the limitations? And this is something that Odin must uh, uh, understand and discover. What are the limitations? What must be barriers to be uh, outcome in order that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, logistics uh, robots in the, in the hospital become mainstream? become the instruments that every manager of hospital would like to have. Just not only a group of selected people that like to play with, but have to, 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 to have. What are the value added that this robotic is really doing for the, for the, for the hospital? 
And then there are a lot of questions that I would like to add about, but uh, I want to stop here and give the opportunity to others to, to talk. Thank you very yeah. much. Uh, oh, thank you very much, Sergio. I think this, uh, those were very, very, uh, very smart comments, uh, very pertinent. And uh, in fact, I would like to extend, so essentially what Sergio is saying is that logistics is probably uh, the main uh, uh, application field uh, uh, that uh, could allow robotics, in addition to surgery that is already there, and to rehabilitation that is coming, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, make uh, robots popular in hospitals. So uh, Marta and Francesco, who are uh, working in companies, uh, uh, maybe they could express their opinion. And then I would like also to ask another provocative question that uh, is partly related to this, because uh, we could move uh, to, to, the, to, the, to a scenario with, for example, a hospital with uh, patients, doctors, and no other people, no humans, only robots you know, uh, moving around. Is this desirable, uh, your opinion, is what people uh, would like to have? Of course, my answer is no. This was uh, also uh, experienced in the COVID, you know, where clearly uh, human relations were extremely missing in uh, patients uh, suffering uh, with COVID. But it, it's a possible scenario. You know? In a sense, if there are very few humans around, uh, this is very good for robots. Again, robots can move safely and quickly and so on. But is this the right so, design? So, what, is your, your, what is your opinion in terms uh, of uh, both, uh, uh, let's say, industrial uh, uh, view and also your opinion about the acceptability of uh, what is solution by in the hospital? So, Marta first, maybe. Yes, uh, so you were saying before a few examples on the different tasks like for laboratory and so on that are already implemented by robots. And if you think about it, they are, those tasks are the ones that are similar to the manufacturing processes. So the, the, the tasks that are already done by robots in the robotics area are the ones that are almost the same. So there's no human interaction that are almost the same that are used in in the in the manufacturing in the industry so they are putting uh, different tubes in different processes and so on so that's the, that's the key aspect so the i think uh, you were saying before that there there should be more tests more projects more demonstrations of uh, interaction like real interaction between patients and doctors and robots like uh, in service and in logistics so we already know that for surgery there's already existing solutions and they work, but and they are they are not as re, not not focused on research anymore. They are really used in a daily activities in a hospital. So I think I think that what we need to address now is to 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 make the private companies show that it's worth it uh, with demonstration with projects, but it's worth it to do those tests. Because at the end, um, I mean, private companies or public hospitals, but they, are, they have more or less the same focus, the same behavior. So it's cool to have a research project, but uh, you really need to address that uh, something that they, they can see, they can feel, that you can really trust uh, these machines, our machines. So that's, I think that that's more or less what I was saying before, that we need uh, more projects, more tests, more real application so i think we have yeah I, I have a more industrial more point of view and less research so to say but uh, i think there's enough enough research uh, there's enough discovered already to have a fer to have some service robotics and logistic robotics in hospitals already so what really needs to be addressed and implemented is a real application so yeah that's my opinion in as, as test as demonstration maybe uh, surve surveillance and very controlled at the beginning, but to show and do it in many, many different cases so that everyone can see and can feel that th that can exist and that it can attract different investments from the public and the private sector. Thank you, Marta. Uh, Francesco, uh, of course, uh, your job is to create jobs, okay? 
And in order to create jobs, uh, you have to sell robots. So what is your, your opinion as, a, as the CEO of a, of a company? <laughs> this is a good question, but, but uh, I think that um, company has to, for sure, uh, reach the break even as soon as possible and then try to, to sell robots in order to survive. This is uh, one of the first goals, uh, not the uh, survive. Uh, but um, you know, but not only to survive, you know, but to really grow because yeah. that's the point. You know, we of course uh, Europe needs uh, what are called unicorns. You know, this of course. Yeah. Is, I, I, I don't like. I don't like. The, one could say why, uh, and we go back to the very basic question. Uh, I know you know why European companies, even in a promising field like this, uh, with the support of the European Union in terms of. The research project are, uh, I would say, hesitating or not uh, being able to uh, grow as it would be possible. Uh, there are companies, for example, they take Universal Robot. Actually, they became leaders worldwide uh, pretty quickly in the area of uh, collaborative robot. So, how do you see an option for a, a company investing in this field uh, to grow uh, in, in, in the near future? what is missing, uh, we already said, but please, uh, yeah. second round of consideration quickly because we are going to... Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I will try to, 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 to just explain what in my opinion is missing. Uh, from one side, I think that uh, the period of startups, let me say, that sometimes is very good in order to push the limits and create a new economy, a new market, and so this is very good like uh, R&D, for example, in the university. But from the other side, in my opinion, in order to really make uh, big changes in this field, we need to have a little bit more long-term uh, strategy. So this is, in my opinion, what is missing. Even the European project, uh, we have three, four year maximum of project that sometimes, in order to make a big change, like most of the project claim, uh, is not enough. And so the support has to follow up after also the finish, the ending of this project in order to move to make this work. And from the other side, from and this is also internal in the company, if without any long-term strategy, long-term vision, you can't open a real market because most of the time, most of the companies, especially companies that have uh, investors behind, it needs results in two, three, maximum five years in order to become a unicorn or close. In robotics, we have seen this since, uh, since I'm working on it, okay? So the idea is to have a, this long term in order to make this really happen. So uh, having this long term strategy, we can really understand what is the real problem that people have. Because most of the time we just focus on what we have to develop in robotics. And so asking, for example, the question that also Paolo asked me before, what do you need from scientific community in order to do this? Most of the time, the, 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 the research point of view is already mature. So we need that you push the limits in order to create new things. Like Ford said that if you're asking which kind of uh, locomotion tools do you need uh, in the past they ask you that we need a horse that eat less and go faster you know so the, the, the scientific community has to push the limits in order to create new things also crazy one okay but from the other side the company has to fill this gap with a long-term strategy where also institutions can help in order to really focus on the real needs because uh, also internally, sometimes I detect that uh, even in some working with some hospital, we are not really listening. We are trying to, uh, to give our solution in order that this is what you have, just make yourself. And this is not the way to go. We have to really listen what is missing and try to give the solution that are easy and applicable today in order to make better and make this kind of improvements. Thank you very much, Francesco. I, I, I'm afraid the time is uh, finished, but it was a real uh, pleasure. Uh, I think there's a question here, but it is a bit, <laughs> uh, a bit late uh, to ask this question. 
uh, the, the, the idea is about the killer application, use cases that can demonstrate uh, uh, this. Uh, actually, uh, the, the uh, person who attended, I wish to thank uh, him for his, uh, his question, is about uh, his working for a hospital. And uh, ah, it's, a, it's a remark. Actually, he, he is uh, uh, thanking all panelists. So, uh, but uh, it's important to have Odin. I really congratulate Odin for offering the opportunity to a community of uh, researchers, uh, developers, industrial developers, and users to work together and to make a significant step ahead in this. So, I like to thank uh, the speakers, Marta first, uh, Francesco, Gastone, Marta first, because she's a lady, and uh, we are very happy to have uh, her with us. But of course, uh, uh, her contribution was very, very uh, insightful, like uh, Francesco's and Gastone's. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the audience, uh, and I'd like to give the floor to conclude to Sergio. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo. I really congratulate and thank all the speakers and you to, to, to share this uh, dynamic uh, webinar. I take the comment from Francesco Giuliani in the, in the chat. I think that the, he it is to the point and then we all uh, were really around this, uh, the, this topic. And then this is something that uh, for clear Odin uh, has to to consider what is the value proposition and what is the return of investment. Okay, this is very, 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 very good. I have to say that uh, the next webinar is, uh, is about uh, the, the robots in the surgery uh, area. So this is a, a, a quite a specific uh, uh, that was mentioned today, uh, as well as uh, the, the, the most important uh, area of application of, of robotics today in surgery. So thank you very much to, to all of you. We come again uh, with the next uh, webinar in October. The date will be published. And please uh, keep connected and tune it uh, uh, with our uh, uh, website in, in Odin, where we will receive all that uh, information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, speakers. Bye-bye.